How did the universe come into existence? It's a question that most of the world's religions seek to answer. According to the Abrahamic faiths, the world can only exist with the existence of a being who was not caused by something other than itself. And this they call Yahweh, Allah, or God. Philosophical arguments to this end come in many forms, one of which from the medieval Islamic philosopher Ibn Sina, known in the West as Avicenna, claims that we can prove the existence of this necessary being with absolute certainty. If something can exist, there must be an uncaused being. And from this concept alone, Avicenna says that we can deduce every other property that Muslims attribute to Allah. In this interview, we'll be discussing Avicenna and the philosophy of Islam with Dr. Muhammad Salah Zarapur. Currently lecturer in philosophy at the University of Manchester, Dr. Zarapur completed his first PhD at the Tarbet Madras University in Iran and his second PhD at the University of Cambridge. Publishing extensively in philosophy of religion and having worked on major initiatives such as the Global Philosophy of Religion Project, it is safe to say that Salah is one of the world's leading experts in Islamic philosophy. Islam claims to solve the problem of existence, but its implications extend far beyond the origin of the cosmos. Allah is a being invested in his creation, a being that will judge, reward, or punish us for our good and bad deeds. Who permits us to live and to suffer? and differs from the God of Judaism and Christianity in his nature and actions. Thus, we should ask not only whether belief in Allah's necessity is reasonable, but whether the beliefs of Muslims are more or less reasonable than those of their Abrahamic cousins. Hello and welcome to episode 110 of the Pan Psycast. I'm the divinely simple Jack Sives. I'm joined once again by the one and only Mr. Oli Mali. Hello. And proof of the sincere Dr. Mohammed Salah Zarapur. Hello. Welcome to the show, Salah. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So before we jump in, in addition to all of our patrons, we'd like to say a big thank you to the Global Philosophy of Religion Project for making this episode possible. The Global Philosophy of Religion Project at the University of Birmingham is generously funded by the John Templeton Foundation, led by the brilliant Professor Eugen Nagasawa. As part of our partnership, this is the third of five special interviews on the five major world religions, the goal of which being to inspire and diversify new conversations in philosophy of religion. To find out more about the project, you can go to global-philosophy.org or hit the link in the iTunes description. Salah, before we jump in, just before you joined the University of Manchester, you're a full-time researcher on the Global Philosophy of Religion Project. Did you enjoy your time in Birmingham working on the project? Yes, absolutely. I enjoyed it very much and I had a lot of fun there. I learned a lot. We had a very great team of scholars working on different religious traditions. We did a lot of exciting things, editing a book with Eugene, co-editing mm. a book with Eugene, editing a special issue of religious studies on the nature and the existence of deities, and a few conferences and many other things. I enjoyed it very much. And having said that, I'm still an associate member of the project. Oh, so uh, the fun uh, continues. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Salah, this is the first question, in this case the second question, that we normally ask all of our guests. What is philosophy? I think it's not easy to give a straightforward answer to this question, but mm -hmm. I think, roughly speaking, we can say that philosophy is an argument-oriented discipline to discuss the fundamental questions about the ultimate nature of things. Mm -hmm. And of course, in this, I mean, rough definition, there are some terms that must be defined more clearly. For example, mm -hmm. when we talk mm -hmm. about argument, what is the exact meaning of an argument? Or when we talk about the fundamental nature mm -hmm. of things, what is the meaning of the term fundamental mm -hmm. here? But we have a rough idea of these things. And I think this can give us a rough idea of what philosophy is. So when we spoke to Daniel Dennett and our previous guest, Richard Dawkins, they said that the job of philosophy is to get clear on the questions, pass those questions on to science, and it's only science that can make progress with them. Philosophers are kidding themselves if they think they're going to make progress with these questions by sitting in their armchairs. Do you have any sympathy for this view? 
No, honestly, <laughs> because I think there are questions that are not accessible to science. Mm. There are questions that are beyond the scope of science and scientific studies. Mm. And this is the exact place that philosophy can actually work. Mm. And there are questions that we ask about, for example, what's the nature of knowledge? Right. How we can know something? What is science itself? These are questions that cannot be answered by scientific method itself. So mm -hmm. I believe that there are things out of the scope of knowledge and they must be discussed by philosophy. Mm -hmm. For example, I'm talking about things that they don't have any value. For mm -hmm. example, pseudoscience or mm -hmm. something like that. I'm talking about fundamental, important issues about the nature of reality, knowledge, existence, and things like that that we cannot really know just by using scientific methods. So you just mentioned there, there's, there's certain questions that it's harder for the scientist to grapple with than the philosopher. So we're curious, what is it that first got you interested in this subject? You know, we're talking about subjects today such as, you know, God, life after death, faith, personhood, all things Islam. What was it that really sparked your interest in these philosophical questions? My interest in philosophy and philosophy of religion was because of two things. On the one hand, I grew up in a religious family, mm. so I was introduced to religious education when I was a child. But on the other hand, later in school that I was there from the age of 11 to 18, critical thinking was highly promoted mm. and it was particularly promoted by one of our teachers for religious studies. Mm. So in my life, always religion and reason rational, critical thinking and religion and revelation. And these questions about the ultimate reality of our world was interwoven to each other. Mm. So for me, I was always fascinated by the power of reason mm. and uh, critical thinking. But at the same time, I had some very strong religious belief mm. and I wanted to see if they remain plausible mm. if I use and employ those critical thinking methods and tools to assess them. And that was my main motivation for doing philosophy. Mm. But having said that, I started from mathematics because the method of mathematics is the most certain method that we can use in mm. studying things. And in that time, I, I was fascinated by uh, the certainty that we can obtain through doing mathematics. But later, I came to notice that there are many more important things that are beyond the scope of mathematics. There are things that we cannot study just by mathematical tools, even though uh, mathematical tools are in a way more certain. Mm. So I got interested in philosophy more and more, but the change was not sudden. You mentioned at the start when I asked you if you enjoyed working on the Global Philosophy Religion Project, that you edited a special issue of the Journal of Religious Studies, the International mm. Journal for Philosophy of Religion. And I think in your introduction to the papers which are presented in that issue, you say that only 2% of the articles which have been published in the Journal of Religious Studies focus specifically on the philosophy of Islam. And you actually go through that piece and say, you don't like all these phrases like philosophy is Islam, Islamic philosophy, things like that. So you'll have to put it with me describing it as, <laughs> as such. Do you think that philosophy of religion has a diversity issue? And I was also wondering, this might sound a little bit facetious, but does it really matter? Because the Abrahamic faiths have so much in common. Can we not just get along and just do philosophy of God, monotheistic conceptions of God? Yes, unfortunately, the answer is for the first question is positive. I think philosophy of religion has a diversity problem. Right. But the good news is that philosophers of religion are well aware of this problem mm -hmm. and they are trying to fix it. And if you ask whether it is really worth fixing, I would say yes, because mm -hmm. although there are lots of things shared between different Abrahamic religions mm -hmm. and because philosophy of religion has been usually Christianity-centered, we can say that, okay, there are lots of common problems between Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. So they are already discussed in the field, and we don't really need for more diverse approach, even if they can add something 
they won't be something very substantial right. or new. But I disagree. I think there are two things that I have to mention here. First of all, beside, I mean, Abrahamic religions, we have Eastern traditions, Hinduism, mm. Buddhism, that they have big differences with the Abrahamic religion. And if we can consider them and if we can motivate people to work on, in philosophy of religion from those perspectives, then mm. we have access to lots of more new insights, arguments, ideas, and the whole discipline would be more interesting, more diverse. Mm. But on the other hand, even between Abrahamic religion, there are important differences that when they are ignored, we are missing some important things. Mm. And I think having different views from the perspective of different religious traditions can help us not only to better understand our own religious tradition, mm -hmm. but also to better understand the ultimate reality that we are all thinking about. Mm -hmm. And sometimes by looking at another tradition and having an understanding of the solutions that we have for some of their own problems, we can find some answers for our own mm. problems. So basically, this dialogue can help us to have a more comprehensive understanding of not only our own religion, but other religion as well. So many of the philosophers we speak to say they've had intellectual hero seller who have inspired them on their journey. So for previous guests, William Lane Craig, no surprise, said his intellectual hero was Alvin Plantinger. Jessica Fraser said philosophers like Spinoza, Aquinas and Plato. Richard Swinburne said hashtag no heroes. Has there been anyone who has been particularly influential on your own thinking and anybody you would consider an intellectual hero? Yes, absolutely. Among historical figures, of course, Avicenna was mm. very influential in my intellectual life and religious life, of course. Mm. And among contemporary philosophers, Alvin Plantinga and William Alston. In a sense, I can say that they are my heroes in doing philosophy. So a final introductory question we like to ask all of our guests is whether they've changed their mind on any significant philosophical question throughout their lives. So two or three examples from previous guests. Yuji Nagasawa told us he was converted to theism from atheism through the ontological argument. Bill Craig said that he became a Christian in his teenage years after a girl in his German class <laughs> convinced him to find God. And Richard Dawkins, again, our previous mm -hmm. guest, said he abandoned his faith after encountering the work of Charles Darwin. Have there been any big shifts in your own thinking like this? I think in this respect, my life was boring, <laughs> 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 at least from an external point of view, mm. because I had, in my opinion, important changes in my view regarding religion and philosophy, and these changes were not spontaneous and sudden. Mm. They happened gradually, step by step, in a very slow way. But I can say that there has been big differences. For example, when I was 24, 25, I was very, very skeptic about whether or not belief in God can be justified mm. through philosophical arguments mm, right. about the existence of God. And in this sense, I can say that I was very skeptic about a philosophical version of theism. Mm. I have never been an atheist in its full-blown sense, mm. but I can say that I was very, very skeptic about the rationality of theism. Mm. But later, after particularly, I mean, reading Alvin Plantinga and Alston, I came to this idea that, no, I was wrong. There is a huge capacity for rational arguments mm -hmm. justifying the belief in God. Are some of those arguments the ones we're about to talk about? Yes, of okay. course. Brilliant, fantastic. Well, let's jump into it. Part one, Allah. So in this installment, we're going to be discussing the nature and existence of the Islamic God. Perhaps Tawheed is the good place to start, Salah. The Islamic doctrine, which claims that there exists only one God and that God is the ultimate ground of everything in the universe. Do you think that captures the essence of Tawheed? Yes and no, because I think from a 
purely metaphysical, ontological perspective, yes, mm-hmm. Tawhid means that there is only one God. Mm-hmm. Also, it means that the God is simple in its metaphysical sense. But I think the real meaning of Tawhid is not restricted to this. We can say that the belief that everything is under the control of God, everything is in a sense grounded in God. All of these things are in a way part of the belief in Tawhid. Tawhid mm-hmm. means that we don't really see any other substantially important thing in the world. Everything is by God and from God mm-hmm. and everything goes back to God and grounded in God. So this is our first uh, episode with, with ever done on Islam. So we cited at the beginning, does philosophy of religion have a problem with diversity? Unfortunately, we're a part of that problem. <laughs> yeah. I think we're even below 1% being episode 110. We are fixing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, for those who haven't came across any Islamic philosophy before, Tawhid, does it also involve that Muhammad's the one true messenger as well? Tawhid is only about God, is only about Allah and the role that God has in the world. But it doesn't mean that the whole, I mean, pillars of uh, Islam Mm. are restricted to just Tawhid. Mm. Because we usually say that also the the confession to the Prophet Muhammad is part of the pillars of Islam. Okay, good. So would you say Tawhid is something that Jews and Christians can also get on board with? In a sense, yes. I have argued for this in my book, that actually the true meaning of Tawhid or monotheism in this specific sense is something that many people from different religious traditions have already accepted. (laughs) Not only they can, but they have already accepted. So you mentioned earlier that the idea of Tawhid is metaphysically simple. Can we say then that the Muslim concept of Tawhid appeals to Occam's razor? Is it more simple than the kind of Trinitarian idea of God within Christianity? or more simple than some of the pantheistic leanings of some Hindu traditions? It's true that one is simpler than three, but the (laughs) argument (laughs) for the oneness and unity of God is not just based on this kind of argument. I think the argument for the unity of God in Islam, the argument for Tawhid, is a bit more complicated. But regarding the other thing that you mentioned about pantheism, There are some mystical interpretations of Quran Mm. in which the world must be seen in a pantheistic way. Mm. This approach was not something that everybody is happy with. Mm. And certainly it's not the mainstream view of Muslims. But still, this is something that some really important figures in the history of Islamic thought accepted. They believed that pantheism is the most plausible option we have when we see the world. So it's worth saying that there is a diversity of thought within Islam as a tradition itself. Of course, like all other traditions, we cannot say that this is the only plausible way of understanding Islam. Like Mm -hmm. many other religions, you know, there are different understanding of the scripture. There are different views about God's existence, God's attributes, Mm -hmm. the arguments that work, the argument that doesn't work. And all of these things form a very, very diverse environment. Mm -hmm. So the Islamic conception of God being monotheistic, it doesn't involve three aspects of God like the Christian faith does. What do you make of the argument put forward by some of our previous guests, like William Lane Craig and Richard Swinburne, who say there's powerful evidence for thinking that Jesus was raised for the dead, for example, and that resurrection shows God's approval of the message that Jesus was giving during his life. I'm God with you, right? So if he's saying that and then God resurrects him, that's reason to think that God isn't just this one being, that actually he involves this incarnation as well. I think at least some of those arguments that you mentioned are heavily based on historical Mm. evidence. Mm. Unfortunately, I'm not a historian of religion, so I cannot really assess those arguments. But I can refer the audience to a very interesting paper by Zain Ali, which is about the Islamic responses that can be offered to the arguments by William Lane Craig. Mm. And I think in that paper, he has discussed all of these historical evidence and whether or not they are compatible with the text of the Quran. I can say very briefly that there are interpretations from the scripture that Mm. even if we accept all those historical evidence that Mm. are mentioned by Craig and other people, 
we can still say that this does not provide plausible ground for the ontology that Christianity offers for right. God. Mm-hmm. And I think the verses that we have in the text of the Quran about Christianity is exactly about this, that the idea of Trinity is not acceptable. I think mm. it can be compatible at least by some interpretations and exegetical moves with some of the things that mainstream Christian thinkers say. We'll make sure we link to that paper on, on the website yeah, sure. if anyone's interested in reading it. One of Islam's most influential philosophers and a particular favorite of your own is Avicenna. Uh, for those who might be hearing about Avicenna for the first time, could you tell us who he is and perhaps why you're such a big fan of his work? Avicenna is probably, not probably, Avicenna is arguably <laughs> the most influential Muslim philosophers. Mm. He died in 1037 at the age of 57. Mm. He wrote lots of very interesting, influential works in many different disciplines. He was basically a polymath. He wrote on philosophy, physics, logic, medicine, mathematics, many different areas. And he was so influential with a bit exaggeration, we can say that he made Muslim philosophers forget about Aristotle. Because Mm. until his time, the authority to appeal for Muslim philosophers was Aristotle. Mm. But after him, the authority to appeal was Avicenna. Mm. Even those people who actually hated Avicenna, they just referred to him and mentioned him several times in their works. Could you briefly say how Avicenna's general approach differs from that of Aristotle's? Why First of all, change? his work was not just commentaries on Aristotle. Mm. because, And this was a big change. Because although he was heavily relying on Aristotle's work, but About almost every single point, he had his own ideas as well. So he was a very original thinker Mm. with very authentic ideas. He read all the important works translated into Arabic Mm. before him, but his views was not just explaining the views of people before him and, you know, Mm. correcting them. Mm. He had some original views as well. And he was not basically scared by any authority. He had his own ideas. And I think that was the big change. And after Avicenna, people just thought that, okay, even if we want to discuss Aristotle, there are lots of more important things that we can find in Avicenna that they are not really there in Aristotle. So they thought that if we discuss Avicenna, we have both Aristotle and some other new interesting stuff. As I said, there is a little exaggeration because there are still some philosophers like Averroes that encouraged people to go back to Mm. Aristotle and they said that the real philosophy is Mm. there. Avicenna actually was a deviant, I mean, uh, from the mainstream philosophy. But I think in a very general overall picture, what Mm. I said is true. Let us pause for a moment to say a quick thank you to our loyal and dignified patrons for making the show possible. In particular, a very special thank you to the man staying light and breezy in his black and white turban. It's Mr. Adam Cool. Buzzing to hear that caffeine was one of the causes of the Islamic Golden Age. It's Mr. T. He's not the prophet Isa. He's a very naughty boy. <laughs> it's the life of Brian Ramirez. She believes that the afterlife is eternal. It's Miss Lily Hooper. The sweet and tasty fruit awaiting us in paradise. It's Andrew Cherryman. He always completes his five daily prayers. Even if he's bobbing on the water, it's Pedalo. He's a massive fan of building interfaith dialogue between Islam and Christianity. It's St. David Ligeness. Allah may be omnipotent, but is he omni-smelly? Perhaps not, but one man is. It's John Breeden. Jealous that Mohammed didn't fly to heaven on a horny sheep, it's John Gauthier. <laughs> the beauty of the Grand Mosque takes his breath away, it's Jamie Long. After saying salam alaikum, he always leans in for a smooch, it's Michael Kisley. Walking them rather than driving to Hajj, it's Jay Wheelless. And the man whose name is even more difficult to pronounce than Quranic Arabic, it's Miron van der Kolk. If you, dear listener, want to help our most gracious and merciful show, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash pansycast to show your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. Right, let's jump back into the discussion. 
So should we dive into Avicenna's ideas then? So in Islamic philosophy, the concept of monotheism is deeply intertwined with the concept of necessary existence. And for Avicenna, all the properties that are usually attributed to God can be extracted merely from the concept of being the necessary existent. Islamic scholars following Avicenna don't do much creation theology. It's for the, quote, less sincere, they say. Instead, they choose to focus solely on a priori arguments for God's nature and existence. Why is it, Salah, do you think that they favor this approach? First off, I should say that it's not exactly correct that we cannot find, I mean, other types of arguments in the Islamic tradition. Mm. For example, a Kalam cosmological argument that mm. is reconstructed in a very brilliant way by William Lane Craig in Contemporary Philosophy of Religion mm-hmm. is kind of arguments that is based on creation. So mm. we have this creation-oriented theology in the Islamic tradition. In the same manner, we have uh, some arguments by people like Averroes based on arguments which look very close to, for example, the arguments from order or fine-tuning arguments or Mm. something like that. But arguments based on the conception of God as the necessary existent is the argument that is proposed by Avicenna and Mm. that is something that I'm really interested in. So my being interested in this argument doesn't mean that there aren't other arguments from different perspectives. Yeah. What do you make of the Kalam cosmological argument? Because you had Bill Craig on talking about it, just to remind listeners, because everything that begins to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist, so therefore the universe must have a cause. That's a nice simple argument to get us to God's existence. I think it? uh, it's a very interesting and simple argument, but I have some doubts about its strengths, uh, especially mm. about the second premise of this argument, that is the finitude of the past, or right. that the world has... A beginning. I think in philosophical arguments that we have for this premise are not really convincing, especially the argument for the impossibility of actual infinite. Because one of the arguments that are presented to support this premise is Uh that, okay, if the past is infinite, then we have some sort of actual infinity. Mm -hmm. And there are different arguments to show that actual infinity cannot exist, Mm -hmm. therefore Mm -hmm. the past cannot be infinite. But I think, first of all, in the very strict sense of actuality that we consider, for example, in the context of Avicenna's philosophy, Mm -hmm. the past doesn't form any actuality because moments of the past don't exist. Mm -hmm. So even if we have some sort of whole part equality, when we have an infinite collections of past events, Mm -hmm. we cannot conclude some sort of absurdity from them. Just so we don't leave this behind here, because this is really interesting and something that comes up in your work. And it was fascinating to me when I was looking at it. And I wasn't going to mention it, but you've mentioned it. So it might (laughs) be interesting to ask. So that's my fault. (laughs) Could you say, could you briefly say, because I can imagine it's a huge, could you briefly say, we've introduced Avicenna, we've said what his general approach is and where he is in the history of philosophy. Could you briefly say why he doesn't think that the past exists? Or is Avicenna's view that it's all in the same, not in the same moment? Is that the right way to put it? How would you explain his view of the past? The problem is not that they don't exist in a very absolute sense. The problem is that they don't exist at the same time with the moment of the present, with no. Mm. But the problem is that if you want to argue for the absurdity of a whole part equality, yeah. all parts of that whole must exist at the same time together, right. at the same moment of time. Mm. Otherwise, why we can say that and this is absurd? You know, mm-hmm. For example, even the proponent of the Kalam cosmological argument, they accept the existence of an infinity doesn't raise any logical absurdity. Mm -hmm. They say that it's just a metaphysical absurdity that we cannot have, I mean, a whole part equality Mm -hmm. uh, when we have an actual infinity. They accept the existence of um, infinite sets of numbers, for example, in a purely mathematical sense Mm -hmm. without having any metaphysical weight. But they say that if they want it to be, for example, objects. Mm -hmm. We cannot, real objects, material objects, we cannot have an infinite number of objects. Why? Because if we have an infinite number of objects, 
then we have some sort of whole party quality. The mm. number of numbers from one, two to infinity is equal to the number of numbers from two to infinity because we can have a correspondence here. But the problem is, so we have kind of, I mean, whole part equality here. Mm. But they say that the whole part equality, as long as it is just purely mathematical, purely logical, it doesn't raise any problem for us. Mm -hmm. But when they are, in a sense, incarnated, when they are objectified, when we are talking about material objects, it doesn't make sense to talk about a material object or a material magnitude, for example, that is equal to its proper part. And Avicenna says that, okay, if these proper parts of the whole that we have, they don't exist really, really together at the same time, then how we can make sense of this absurdity? Let's bring us back to what Ollie introduced a moment ago, which was that Avicenna thought that there's a thing which is being the necessary existent, in the same way that Anselm thought there was a being that which nothing greater can be conceived. Avicenna says there's a being that has necessary existence or is necessary existent. Why would we think that in the first place? Why would we think God or just the necessary existent, an uncaused thing, a thing that contains within itself its own cause, why would we think something like that exists? In the most straightforward way, I can say, because the necessary existent cannot fail to exist. So the necessary existent cannot not exist. Right. But why think there's a necessary thing in the first place? Why can't we have just like, so I'm a contingent thing. I depend on the oxygen in the room, the coffee in my system, that my parents meeting on that fateful day and him saying the right thing on that <laughs> first date, perhaps, mm. so on and so forth. Why can't I just have an infinite series of all of these contingent things? Why can't everyone do everyone else's washing? I think if <laughs> the answer is, Avicenna's argument uh, for the existence of God, that is his famous proof of the sincere. Things are either impossible mm. or contingent or necessary. Okay. And this is a very logical, a straightforward distinction. Mm -hmm. So we cannot say that there is something, you know, that is not impossible, not contingent and not necessary. Mm. Everything is either impossible to exist or contingent or necessary. Mm -hmm. Among those things that are contingent, some of them, they don't exist, but they can come to existence. Mm. And some of them, they exist, but they can go out of existence. So contingency means that, in a sense, they can exist and they can fail to exist. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, contingent things are neutral with respect to existence. Right. Okay, good. Mm. So square circle is an impossible thing, exactly. like a married bachelor. A contingent thing could be this my chair. future children, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or, this, or that chair or that microphone. Yes. And then there are necessary things which contain their own cause that don't require a cause outside of yes, themselves. Yes, exactly. But the problem is that if something is contingent, it is part of its meaning, the meaning of contingency, that it is neutral yeah. with respect to existence. Mm -hmm. neither it is a necessary existent nor it is an impossible thing so it can exist and it can fail to exist both of them and if something is neutral there must be something to change this neutrality mm -hmm. and make one side heavier to preponderate existence over non-existence or non-existence over existence okay. so there must be a cause so every contingent existent has a cause. Mm -hmm. That's the most important part. It's mm -hmm. kind of, I mean, the principle of a sufficient reason that we later see in, for example, Leibniz, mm -hmm. and it can be shown that it was under the indirect influence of Avicenna through Thomas Aquinas. Consider one of them, you know? I think. Uh, yes, yeah. There's at least, there is, at least, is there a flying man argument? And uh, it's a bit... Okay, um, we'll different, that. yeah, <laughs> then, yeah. Let, you, me, or the listener at least yes. knows that they <laughs> yeah. exist. Yeah, but let's return to that argument later. But mm. you know, okay. that we, we all know that something exists at least, you know? Mm. And the question is that whether or not this is contingent or necessary or something like that. Mm. If it is necessary, then we have what we want. You know, mm. there is something there is necessary. necessary there is a necessary existence. And if it is contingent, then it must be caused by something else. The usual move, argumentative move that we have here is that 
the cause of this existence must be caused by something else and then we have an infinite chain of causes mm. right and this cannot be infinitely extended because infinite regress is impossible therefore mm. there must be a necessary existent Avicenna doesn't reject this argument, mm -hmm. but his own argument, his main argument for the existence of God is not this. He says that, okay, even if we accept that there can be a chain, an infinite chain of things that are causally connected to each other, mm -hmm. you can still talk about the whole chain. Great. Mm. And you can still talk about all contingent beings in the world, you know? Mm. So he asked us to, First, suppose that there is no necessary existent. Yeah. Mm. Second, consider all contingent beings in the world. Mm. Perhaps you say that this would be the whole universe itself. Yeah. Then he asks that, okay, this thing, the whole universe itself is a contingent being or a necessary being. Mm. Mm. If you say that it's a necessary being, then we have a necessary existent. Right. If you say that it's a contingent being, there must be a cause for this. But the cause must be something outside that thing, and then it would be not a contingent thing. It must be necessary. This is brilliant. You explained that really well. Okay, so you have a, like a big line of contingent things. Either that big line is contingent or it's necessary. If it's necessary, then you've got your necessary being. The whole universe can be necessary or it can be contingent. Either the universe itself is the necessary thing, or it's contingent and therefore the necessary things outside of itself. No matter how you cut the cake, it yeah. always comes out as a necessary thing. But I imagine very few people who are listening to this are going to disagree with that, right? You might exactly. have the Abrahamic believer who goes, yeah, my necessary things outside the universe itself. We call it Allah, we call it God, whatever you want to call it. But you might have a pantheist listening who goes, yeah, the universe is God. The universe is the necessary thing. We could even have an atheist listening when we spoke to Dan Dennett, he said, if there's a necessary thing, let it be the universe. Exactly. Avicenna seems like the guy for all of these people. <laughs> yeah. He's going to get along with everyone. He's everyone's favorite person at the party. Yes. Why would you favor then an Islamic conception of God over a pantheist, a panentheist, an, an atheist conception of the universe? First of all, what you said actually shows that Avicenna's argument is very powerful, very mm -hmm. strong. But in the first step, Avicenna doesn't have any problem with someone who says that the whole universe is a necessary existent. But in the second step of his, I mean, project, he would say that the universe cannot be the necessary existent. Right. Why? Because it's not simple, because uh -huh. it has parts. So he should provide an argument for the simplicity of the necessary existent. Mm. And to do this, he first proves that there cannot be more than one necessary existent. Mm -hmm. So he first shows that there must be only one necessary existent. And then for the moment, you know, just accept that there is only one necessary existent. Mm. If there is only necessary existent and that necessary existent is compound, it's composite, mm. it has parts, then the question is that whether or not those parts are contingent or necessary. Yes. They cannot be contingent because if the parts of something are contingent, that thing must be contingent itself. Right. Because if a part of something can fail to exist, it means that the whole thing can fail to exist. The whole thing as it is, you know, uh -huh. can fail to exist. So it's not a necessary existence. So if something is necessary, all its parts must be necessary. Mm. But if we have something with at least two necessary parts, it means that we have two necessary existent. Mm. But we suppose that we have only one necessary existent. Mm. Therefore, the necessary existent cannot have parts. Okay. But you may ask now that, okay, what's the argument mm. for the uniqueness of the necessary existent? Why we have only one necessary existent? Why we don't have two, I mean, necessary existent? The answer is that suppose that there are two necessary existents. Mm. There must be something through which they are distinct from each other. There must be an individuating factor uh, for each of these things. Otherwise, it would be the same thing. Yes, exactly. Otherwise, there would be completely identical things, which means basically the same mm. thing, one thing, not two things. Mm -hmm. So there must be an individuating factor. And then the question is that whether or not that individuating factor is essential 
to the necessary existence. It's part right. of the essence of the necessary existence, mm. or it's something accidental. It's something that is added yeah. to that thing. If it is essential, then because the essence of two necessary existence is the same, their essence is necessary existence. Yeah, they share the same essence. Mm. Same you know. Thing. So if that individuating factor is essential, then it means that they both have that in individuating factor. So they yeah. are the same thing, you know? So it cannot be essential. It cannot be, the, the individuating factor cannot be essential to that thing, cannot be part of the essence of that thing. It must be something accidental. It must be something added to that thing. Yeah. Okay. But if something is added to a necessary existent, it means that it is at least partially caused by something else. Mm. And when something is partially caused by something else, it cannot be necessarily existent because it depends on some other things. Mm. So this rules out the universe because it's made of composite things. Exactly. It rules out a pantheistic approach because again, the universe has got composite bits in it. It rules out a Trinitarian idea, which has multiple parts. You're left with Tawheed, what we came back to at the start of the episode, right? The idea of one being, one existent being. But at the same time, there are some things, some interesting, important things that are still preserved. For example, about pantheistic view. This is true that the whole universe is not God, mm. but God, according to the Avicennian view, is the pure notion of existence, is the most perfect sort of existence. Mm. So in a sense, we are shallow versions of God. <laughs> <laughs> it means that God is the pure existence God is the most perfect existence, but then we have a different grades of existence. Mm. And by graduating these things in different levels, we have a hierarchy of different existence that in a sense, they have something in common mm. with God that is existence because God is the most perfect sort and type of existence in a way. So something in the core of pantheism is still preserved, but not in exactly the same way that they say, the defender of the pantheism say. So I really like this argument from Avicenna. I see the importance and significance as simplicity here in getting us away from all these alternative concepts and getting us towards the Islamic or the Abrahamic concept of the necessary existence, the, the God outside of the universe. So if it has these extra parts which are contingent, then they're not a part of the necessary existence itself. And the whole necessary existence might fail to exist if it's one of its parts is contingent. And if it has additional parts, then they too would be necessary existence. But you told us there could only be one necessary existence, so it has to be the simple God. Yeah. I think that's a really nice way of understanding it. I had one thought though, which was that Nagasawa in his book Maximal God tries to deduce all of God's attributes from the Anselmium notion of the greatest metaphysical being, the greatest being that could be conceived. And he tells us that rather than having the omni-properties, um, all-powerful, all-knowing, all all-loving, that God might have a different combination, the logical combination of these properties, which is logically possible, the greatest being that have this set. So it might not be so powerful that he can create a stone so heavy that he himself can lift it, or he might not have the power to sin and all these traditions, or you might not have the power to stop evil, or something along those lines. Whatever problems you have, you can kind of alter the concepts of God to you not beholden to those properties. You can alter it in the light of these issues. So you could have a God that's quite powerful, but not all powerful, but all loving and all knowing. You could have a God that's not quite all loving, but all knowing and all powerful. So I was thinking maybe you could run an Anselmian argument to say that you can have lots of different necessary beings. And that's typically a problem with people put against the ontological argument, isn't it? You could keep running it and get lots of different mm. metaphysically great beings. Rambling. Here's the point which I actually wanted to raise, which is that it seems like one of my favorite Jewish philosophers, uh, Moses Mendelssohn, has a similar argument, writing during the time of the Jewish Enlightenment, the Haskalah, and he says, I think, therefore, there is a God. And so he says, at least one thing exists and therefore there must be a necessary existent. But it seems like Avicenna is going even one step further than Mendelssohn. He thinks that's the most simple way of putting it forward. Avicenna says, if there's the possibility that I could exist, then there's a God. So he doesn't need, even need to make the claim that something exists. Just the possibility that something could exist would mean there's a 
God. Could you just tell us how he makes that move from needing something to exist with as a God to even the mere possibility that there could be a thing means there must be? This is not something that he explicitly mentioned in his works, but it is something that can be extracted from his works. First of all, we can show by the proof of the sincere that if something exists, then there must be a necessary existent. Mm -hmm. But with some, I mean, very simple model logic tools and with some simple rules, we can conclude from this premise that if it is possible that something exists, then it is possible that a necessary existent exists. Mm -hmm. But the consequence is that it's possible that something exists. But if it is possible that a necessary existent exists, then there must be a necessary existent. It's yep. something very similar to Plantinga's argument yeah. for the existence of God, I mean, the ontological argument. Therefore, from these three, I mean, things, Avicenna's proof of the sincere, the modal move that we have here, and we can conclude that if it is possible that something exists, then it's possible that a necessary existent exists. And Plantinga's ontological argument, which is acceptable in an Avicennian framework, we can conclude that if it is possible that something exists, then there must be a necessary existent as well. So there you go. We've proved the existence of a necessary existent simply from our armchairs a priori. Are there any problems with this view? We'll find out in two weeks' time in our next installment. But for now, it shall remain a mystery. The Mystery Philosopher. Hello and welcome to Mystery Philosopher. You're going to hear the voice of a mystery philosopher from the past. And Ali and Sarah are going to try and guess who they think this person is. Another dangerous property of worldly things is that they at first appear as mere trifles. But at each of these so-called trifles branches out into countless ramifications until they swallow up the whole of a man's time and energy. Isa, on whom be peace, said... The lover of the world is like a man drinking seawater. The more he drinks, the more thirsty he gets, till at last he perishes with thirst unquenched. I mean, it's not going to be Avicenna because that would be too obvious, right? <laughs> is, but, so I'm going to go with, you probably pick someone who's another Muslim thinker, like Averroes, maybe? It's not. Yeah. It's another famous Muslim philosopher, though. The book Alchemy of Happiness. Yes. What's more? Al-Ghazali. Very good, sir. Yeah. Well done, you've won this tree philosophy. <laughs> I thought that would be really obvious to the both of you. That's way too easy. <laughs> Sorry, I'm putting you down no, there. No, that's, that's okay, it's fine. Two it's very, a, a very yeah. good guess, yeah. Arian, so uh, well done. <laughs> Join us in a couple of weeks' time where we'll be engaging in some further analyses and discussion. It's already available to our wonderful patrons over at patreon.com forward slash panpsychast. So we'll see you over there or in two weeks' time. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Psychast. The next installment of this episode will be available a week on Sunday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the next installment of the show. To support the podcast and get yourself heaps of extra perks, head over to www.patreon.com forward slash pan or hit the link in the iTunes description. To find out more about the show and get all of our old episodes completely free, you can visit thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That was great. That was really good. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. (laughs) That was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're doing a wonderful thing with this. (laughs)